This week's topic is mass wasting and subsidence. So beginning this week we're going to be doing um, what in a normal semester I would cover in two weeks in one week. So there are like a couple of related questions or topics and we'll cover them together. So let's go to the questions for the week. Um, <clears throat> would you live on a slope or an area prone to subsidence? If so, where? And what level of risk is acceptable to you? How would you know if the slope or subsidence risk was assessed accurately? And what should be done by people and communities in areas prone to slope failure and or subsidence um, to prepare for the hazard and prevent catastrophe? So the two hazards are slopes and subsidence. They're related, but they're not the same. So you want to make sure that you address both of those in your homework answers and in your discussion this week. And I'll be monitoring the discussion to make sure every group um, does address that. So the questions to consider, to think about as we're going through the material this week are um, what factors impact the stability of a slope? So if you're deciding if a slope is a good place to live on, if you're assessing the hazard, you want to think about the factors that impact the stability of a slope. And then what areas are prone to subsidence? So subsidence is the collapse of the subsurface. Essentially the ground drops out from beneath your feet. And so what are the characteristics that would result in that? So these aren't necessarily as straightforward for a lot of people as, uh, as flooding or volcanoes. However, um, I think you'll find that, especially with slope stability, that this is something that's actually pretty easy um, for the average person to assess. So what we're looking at is mass movement of earth materials. Um, mass wasting is the downslope movement of earth materials, and it's caused by gravity. And you can see a picture on the right-hand side here of a landslide and there at the base is what we'll call a flow. So the material slid down the slope, had a fair amount of moisture mixed in and it, it flowed out over the top of that subdivision. On the lower left um, is a picture of subsidence. It's when the ground is not supported and it just drops out. It's a vertical movement um, and it's caused by loss of support and of course it's also um, related to gravity kind of pulling things down. So <clears throat> we'll start with mass movements. Um, mass movements cause structural damage um, and surface disruption. I should say we'll start with landslides. And you can see landslides on the right um, at the top and at the bottom. Uh, you'll notice that the type it's damaged a road uh, that was built along the side of a hill. Part of the road gave way. And in the lower right, you can see that several houses um, slid down the hill with that um, landslide. Subsidence, like I said, is a little more subtle, or can be. Um, on the left, at the bottom, uh, you see an area that's been impacted by mine subsidence. And you'll notice that the sidewalk kind of has some waves in it um, that are obvious. And if you were driving down the street, you'd see that as well. As you might imagine, this can cause a lot of damage to homes. So let's take a look at slopes. Um, the slope factors are actually things that are pretty logical. So at the top of our list, we have the angle of the slope, which is probably the single most important factor. And then as we move down the list, um, probably the second most important factor is the water content. Um, we see water as a, as a trigger. For a lot of landslides, you'll see them happening after a large rainstorm. It kind of loosens the material up. Um, material composition and orientation are important. Um, how strong is the earth material that holds up that slope? And what's its orientation? You'll notice on this uh, drawing in the lower right, they have something called bedding planes labeled. If they're parallel to the slope, uh, then they give a little bit less support and things are more likely to give way. If you can imagine those bedding planes going into the slope um, at a right angle to the direction that they show, that usually gives you a much more stable situation. 
Vegetation is going to be a very important uh, characteristic to look at. Uh, the roots tend to remove moisture and hold the slope in place. So usually if we see a lot of vegetation that uh, indicates a, a more stable slope. Um, the downside of vegetation is that if it gets really big it can act as a load on the slope which can be bad. And you can see in the drawing here on the right um, they've got some buildings built on the slope um, and they've moved some material which can also load the material. Uh, undercutting of support, uh, not a good idea. This In this picture here it's um, a man-made undercut. Uh, you can see where somebody probably took a bulldozer in there and kind of moved out the material to make a flat place for houses. Uh, but this can also happen naturally in the upper right uh, that picture shows a coastline and the waves are actually eating away at the base of the slope and undercutting it. And the last thing on the list is the weathering of materials. As time goes by, um, the materials will be subject to weathering processes um, that are natural. We expect them at the Earth's surface, uh, but they tend to make the rocks weaker um, and over time will uh, make the slope less stable. So those are some of the primary slope factors. And again, uh, if you read through the book, I think these will be pretty logical things uh, that most people can, can think of when they're evaluating a slope. So this next slide is triggers. And you'll notice that these are generally related to um, those slope factors. Rainfall, of course, would add water and, and destabilize the slope. Uh, vibration, we didn't mention, but... In our discussions on earthquakes, some people mentioned that um, shaking of the um, Earth's surface can lead to uh, slope failure. So sometimes we see slope movement when there are earthquakes. Uh, undermining we mentioned and loading as well. So those actions can actually then trigger a slope failure. As scientists, we like to name things. And so we categorize slopes um, or slope failures as Primarily slides and flows, those are the two biggies. Um, a slide just means that the material was coherent, it was together, it moved as a unit. And a flow means that it's kind of tumbling over itself, it's all mixed up. Uh, flows tend to involve um, a lot of moisture, but not always. In our drawing on the right hand side here, you can see a, f a slide and a flow. You can also see a fall. Um, when rocks kind of free fall through the air, that's called a fall. In the middle on the right, you'll notice um, a very common type of slope failure we have in our area, uh, something called a slump. It's a rotational slide. You'll notice the arrows up the top show kind of a curved movement. You'll also notice that at the bottom of that, it becomes a flow. So after it moves out, um, the toe kind of kicks out and can get mixed with moisture and become a flow. Uh, creep, I should mention, is a very slow process. And a lot of steep slopes will show slides and flows, but they might also show creep over extended periods of time. And um, like I said, creep is a very slow process, but it can damage buildings. If your building is there and the slope is just moving a couple inches a year, after 10 years, that's 10 inches, and that um, you're getting close to a foot, and that's a lot of motion um, for a what should be a stable structure. So those are our types of slope failures. And this next slide shows how we address slope failures. Um, identification and mapping is key. Um, what we've seen with the with the other hazards is we always like to look at the history of a hazard and that helps us figure out what's likely to happen in the future. Um, if we know we have an unstable situation, a steep slope for example, we can then monitor it. There are uh, The simplest thing you can do is survey it in and then come back a year or two or ten years later and do another survey and see if it moved. Um, there are also pieces of equipment that you can stick into a slope that will um, show you if the slope is moving um, on a real-time basis. And then there are ways to stabilize. So you can read about these in your book. Uh, 
um, but you can see a number of things they've got here in pictures on the lower left you can see a wall built up at the base of a slope to kind of hold it into place on the lower right you can see they built walls uh, but they also installed vegetation which is going to be helpful um, in the middle on the right on the far side you can see um, some surface drains so anything to get water off the slope is going to be helpful and you can read about more uh, slope stabilization things in in your book and you can read that about that picture in the upper right which is a, a, a slope hazard map very very useful um, piece of research to have if you're in an area with unstable slopes so we move on to subsidence. We left it behind for a few minutes, but uh, the basic cause of natural subsidence is, is when a cave collapses. And so if you have underground caverns, uh, over time they tend to get bigger as the rock dissolves and is removed, and eventually the surface will collapse. So that's a natural um, subsidence feature. The other ones here are not natural. While tectonic movement is natural, that's on the bottom left, we find that in some places along the coast. Um, but that's nothing we would find here in Illinois. You can see um, some subsidence um, sometimes before an earthquake and sometimes after. Uh, the earthquake in Japan that created a tsunami a few years ago um, also caused um, anywhere from one to three feet of subsidence. Uh, and that was right before the tsunami came in. The human causes are in between there. Um, groundwater loss, if we pump too much water out of the ground, the pore spaces that the water was in can collapse and cause surface subsidence. And it might not seem like that big of a deal, how big could those pores be? Uh, but in some places in California, they've withdrawn enough groundwater to cause surface subsidence on the order of tens of feet. Um, so it can be dramatic if you really remove a lot of groundwater. Um, mining, uh, obviously if we remove material from below the surface, uh, the surface can collapse. This is a big issue in our area um, in Illinois. Um, throughout the state we have places where coal has been mined and removed and uh, that results in mine subsidence. So kind of depending on where you live, um, this can be an issue in Illinois. And then in the middle they have expandable soils and it's a natural process but it's not anything you would notice unless you happen to build a house. It's usually um, people get in the way of these soils that naturally shrink when they dry out and swell when they absorb water. Um, in nature, it's not something that would cause damage or be a hazard. Um, in areas with human construction, that changing of the soil, the shrinking and swelling, can actually cause a lot of damage. <clears throat> so what does a sinkhole look like? Well, this is a big sinkhole that formed in Florida um, a few years ago. Swallowed a car, swallowed some municipal, sw a municipal swimming pool, swallowed the backsides of some buildings um, and this is not uncommon in in Florida it also happens in certain places in Illinois so you have to know um, where the soluble bedrock is where caves form so usually if you have caves you will probably have some sinkholes a couple years ago a sinkhole formed under the National Corvette Museum and swallowed some Corvettes um, and that's a place where they should have known there was a potential issue because there were sinkholes right next to the museum already um, and a new one just opened up under one of their display rooms. So what do you do about the sinkhole hazard? Well, there's not really a lot of ways to stop it, um, but you can certainly identify places that are prone to subsidence. So where do you have the kinds of rock that can collapse? Where do you have undermining? Um, where are there um, people withdrawing a lot of groundwater? So you just look for the kinds of things that would result in surface subsidence um, and you try to avoid those if you can.